Tonight we'll be in Genesis chapter 35. And our theme tonight is welcome. We're, we're glad you came. <laughs> tonight, tonight's theme is surrender. 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 Genesis 35. Surrender. And, and you probably have heard me use that word quite often lately. Surrender. Because I believe that it's something that we have to do on a daily basis. Don't you agree? Every day you have to say, Lord, I surrender my will to you today. Because I will probably encounter some situation, some ordeal, some opportunity, and I have to surrender myself to your will. Whatever it is that you want to do in my life. And Jacob really is a great example of that, is he not? He literally is learning how to surrender to the will of the Lord. He's learning to let go and let God take control. He is just a co-pilot and God is the pilot and we just kind of follow along the pilot as he directs and leads us and sometimes he lets go of the wheel so we grab it and we hold on to it as he's got us in a straight uh, line uh, going in a direction and so we seem to be the ones feeling like we're in control but in reality God has set the course and we need to stay that course tonight we're going to look at three things salvation consecration and blessings salvation consecration and blessings and i will define those words for you i really do believe that those words are very very important especially salvation salvation and the work of salvation is so misunderstood by believers today it really is i think if we understood salvation truly understood it there'd be revival in our nation there really would be because what salvation entails is a revived spirit, Amen. not a dead spirit, but one that is alive to God, one that consecrates itself and then enjoys the blessings. The blessings of God would be my third point. So, so let's look at the context here before we get into tonight's message. Jacob is traveling on his way to Bethel, again following in the footsteps of Abraham, his forefather. Uh, we see that Jacob, saw the Lord in a vision as he was there in the promised land and God had given him that vision that he would promise to pass the blessings of Abraham on to him. Now why did God bother to uh, share with him once again about the promises of God? I think it's to remind us that Jacob, in spite of his flesh, was still a child of God and, and was, in, was still entitled to those promises. You know, when God gives a promise... He's going to fulfill his promise, whether we keep our promises or not. God is always faithful. God's calling of him was gracious and irrevocable. You can't irrevoke God's calling on your life. What you have to do is submit yourself to that calling. When God calls you, he calls you very clearly, and you have to obey that calling that God has called you to. And if you disobey it, and we have a great example with uh, Jonah, right? A perfect example. God has a way of bringing you back around. It's irrevocable, and we shouldn't fight against it. And even though Jacob kind of messed up along the road many, many times, God was still going to fulfill his calling in his life. God would do what he said he would do. He would father a nation, and he did. He would raise up kings, and he definitely did. They would inherit the land of their fathers, and they did. And they are in that land to this day. Back in 1948, the Lord blessed them and gave them that land. And it is their land, and it's nobody else's land. And in fact, they're being gracious by not taking back what God has originally given them as a land and allowing the surrounding Arab nations to be where they're at. They need to stop building and leave. But that's my opinion. They're being gracious as they always are. And God is good to them. The list of this immediate descendants here, we'll see in the latter part of this chapter, from Reuben to uh, Benjamin, who will be born in this chapter. And the promises will be passed on uh, to Judah. So let's go ahead and look at verse 1 here as God commands Jacob to go to Bethel. 
So after the incident with Diana, if you were here last week, we heard the story of Diana and the struggle that took place there, um, the deaths that uh, Diana's brothers caused, the the um, separation of the communities around them uh, caused Jacob to fear, <laughs> and so they're now leaving. They're heading to uh, Bethel. So God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make an altar uh, there before God, the God of Abraham, who appeared to you when you fled from Esau, your brother. You remember the story when Jacob fled Esau? And he came to Bethel there, and he had this vision of the ladder. Well, he's there again. God has a way of bringing you around and reminding you. It's now about eight to ten years since he had returned there to Canaan. When God had said this, when Jacob's family was falling apart, his daughter Diana had just been involved in this illicit relationship with Shechem, the sons of Hamor, and his sons had committed this horrible crime, crime, it was deceitful and treacherous, but when rebuked by their father, they gave no indication of repentance whatsoever for what they did. So Jacob was afraid and knows that he must flee from that community there, least uh, something would happen to them. And in light of the situation, what God says to Jacob just amazes me. It's just amazing when you really think about it. I can't picture that happening in my immediate family, but I'm sure that that has probably happened in, in other families. I'm sure that there has been rape within families, and sadly to say it happens. We live in a fallen world, and then how you deal with those situations as a family, it's, it's horrible. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but it happened in Jacob's life, and the way that they handled it was not the correct way. It, it wasn't the positive way. It wasn't the godly way. It wasn't the Christian way, but they handled it be that as it may. But what's interesting is how God responded to it. Because God didn't say, okay, that's it, Jacob, sit down, I'm done with you. Or to his children. He didn't put them on the bench. He didn't say back off or, you know, that's it, it's all over. No, he said, rise up and go because God is the God of unbelievable grace. And that is amazing amazing grace when God can and I'm not saying that he's going to overlook it because you you do so what you reap and God is going to judge them we'll see that later on in the chapters with Reuben he gets judged as being the older brother but God does judge them and they're going to go through some things but God's promises will be fulfilled the Lord spoke to Jacob and told him that he would be with him in his journey and would bring him back safely to the land and that he would prosper So God is bringing Jacob back to Bethel where he had made his commitment to the Lord in the first place. Jacob had promised that if God would be with him, if you remember, uh, in his journey, and that when he brought him back, he would give him a tenth of everything that he owed. Uh, Do you think he kept that promise? No, he didn't, by the way. But he did at the time intend to, right? God, if you'll only help me, I'll start tithing. If you get me out of this financial situation, Lord, I'll start tithing. And then when God finally gets you out of it, what do you do? Well, I can only afford 1%. And as soon as you give me more, I'll give more. You know? But we're like that. But yet God is still so good to us, isn't he? He is so good to us. That's, I think, why I love God so much. <laughs> but we see Jacob coming back to his roots where he surrendered his life to the Lord, where salvation began where God began to work in his life, in his life. So my first point is salvation. What is salvation? What are the details behind salvation? It's salvation through Jesus Christ. That's the main topic of the New Testament, right? It's the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and what he's done for those who would believe. In the Old Testament, it points to the New Testament salvation by the sacrifices and offering, by the atonement, the day of atonement. The Bible covers uh, topics relating to salvation, to sin, to repentance, and even of forgiveness. According to the Bible, salvation from original sin in particular is made possible by the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. Which in the context of salvation is referred to, as I said, the day of atonement. Now it's important that we understand salvation because I believe that if you do understand it that your life will change 
that you will be a new person. The old life will disappear. Not only will you be amazed, but those around you will be amazed at how you've changed. That you sometimes are nothing like you were before. And they make that comment to you like, what happened to you? You're so different. And I've heard that comment from several of you here. And I think that if we understand what salvation truly is, it will even change your own view of life itself. Salvation is the saving of the soul from sin and death. From sin and death. Your soul has been saved from sin and death itself. It may also be called deliverance. Redemption from sinful nature and it is a promise of eternal life through the Spirit of God. It is a freedom from the flesh and temptations that steer mankind off track from full communion with God. In other words, it gets you back on track and now you have this deep, intimate relationship with God just as God had planned it from the very beginning with Adam and Eve and his ancestors to walk with humanity. I think we have a clear picture of this in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus was speaking to the disciples and he said, Surely I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. You you would think it would be easier because you could pay his way in. (laughs) Just give enough money to the doorman and he lets you right in. But it says it's harder for him to enter heaven. And again, I say to you, he said in verse 24, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's actually easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. Now, some have suggested that it's not literally talking about a needle and, you know, that little eye that you try to get the the thread through. And, of course, the older you are, you need a magnifying glass and get that thing in there. used to be a day when you just get it and put it right in and you're done, but can't see that more well anymore. Some suggest that it was the camel's gate. There was a gate within a gate uh, when you would enter into a community. And the huge gate was the camel's gate, and they'd open that up and a camel could just walk right through. But if there were no camels, you closed the gate and there was a little gate and you opened that gate and a man could get through. And so the camel could not get through that gate. But be that as it may, what it's speaking about is in a, it's easier for something huge to get into something small. And so it is into heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, this is what they said. They were greatly astonished. Who then can be saved? Who then can be atoned for? Who can be delivered and redeemed then? And Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And Peter answered and said, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? With man it's impossible to be saved, but with God it is possible. And Peter immediately understood and says, Look, we've left everything everything to you we have surrendered our life we we have left our homes we have left our families we have left our material things to follow after you what do we have i like the expectation of peter expecting something better than what they had before and that's what to expect that's what we should expect from the lord for our lives so jesus answered peter says surely i say to you that in the regeneration when the son of man sits on the throne of his glory you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wives or children or land, for my name's sake, (coughs) shall (coughs) receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. So you see... what salvation entails it entails a leaving of something and coming to something new better than we can ever imagine it it, it is a leaving of trying to be first in the world it's a leaving of trying to be served in the world to being servants and serving the lord jesus christ the bible is very clear that salvation is a work of god definitely 
For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves. It's nothing you can do. It is a gift of God. And the result of that work, you can't boast. Because it's not your work. It's the Lord's work, definitely. In fact, most Protestants believe that salvation is achieved through God's grace alone. And when salvation is secure in the person, good works will be a result of this. Let me read that again to you because this is where we miss it. Once salvation is secured in the person, when that person truly surrenders and the Spirit enters him and he is truly saved, good works will be a result of this, allowing good works to often operate as the natural signifier of salvation. It is evident that you have been saved because you begin to serve the Lord. Well, how do you receive God's Son? Because of what Jesus Christ accomplished for us on the cross, the Bible states that he that has the Son has life. We can receive the Son, Jesus Christ, as our Savior by personal faith, by trusting in the person of Christ and his death for our sins. Faith, trusting, clinging to Jesus. That is what we should be doing as believers. First John, I'm sorry, John 1, 12 says, to those <clears throat> who received him, he gave them the right to become children of God. John three sixteen says, for this is the way of God. Love, uh, for this is the way of God. Love the world, he gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world should be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. So belief, and belief in the Greek entails trust, clinging to, hoping in, not just I believe that he exists, but there is a trust in him. This means that we must each come to God in the same way, by the way. It's not different for all of us. We all have to come the same way. Let's make an observation. <clears throat> have you ever seen somebody that was on fire for the Lord? I mean, where they're, they just were changed, right? <clears throat> I mean, Forrest definitely was one of those guys. <clears throat> and I've seen many of them <clears throat> throughout my years where... Uh, they get on fire. I remember a young man <clears throat> that came to this church, and this guy was in his uh, teens, high school, and he was hanging around me for quite a while, and he would tell me about the Bible study at the school and how we teach over there and how he wants to do this and how he helps over here. And you, just, you just feel the Spirit moving in his life. He's on fire. So if, if, the, if salvation is the same for all of us, why aren't all of us that way? That's a good question. Because we should, if it's the same salvation, we should. Now, I know I might be challenging some of you right now, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if salvation is given to every one of us the same way, then why aren't others doing it the same way? Because I can remember, I can remember when I first got saved, wow, did my life change. And my wife will tell you that she felt like she was married to a totally different man. Like that old guy was gone. My my thoughts were different. My life became different. I mean, it literally changed, and everybody saw that change. And it, sometimes I don't get it when I see someone, and they're struggling, and they're arguing, and they're gossiping, and they're fighting. I'm thinking, wait a minute. What's wrong here? What's so different? We all come the same way. We all come as sinners who recognize his sinfulness. Definitely. Man, I'm the first to say I am the worst of sinners, like the Apostle Paul. I... I have done the most wretched things in my life. And if I call you a sinner, I am definitely saying I'm a worse sinner than you when I say that. And I literally mean that from my heart right now. I am wretched. And I acknowledge that. There is no good in me at all. The only good that you see in me is because of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus Christ. 
Let me give you an example of that. Last night, um, we, we had an appreciation uh, dinner for all the leadership in, in the church. And we went to Johnny Carino's. And um, so I'm there to serve. I want to serve them because they've been serving in the church and I want to make sure they're served. So I was kind of helping the waitress a little bit, you know, bringing them some plates. And I said, I'll cut, I'll cut that up for you and I'll help you. And so I was kind of going around taking the platters to everyone and things like that. And it, was just, it just felt right. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm a servant. And so then today I come to church and she actually posted something on our, on our Facebook page. And she mentioned that, said, it must be an amazing church to have a pastor actually serve like that. You know? But yet, I know that that isn't me. Because if you caught me before I was a Christian, <laughs> you know, you, you, I wouldn't serve anybody or care about anybody. No, I'm the worst of sinners, and I think that's true of all of us when we realize who we are in Christ Jesus. Second, we realize uh, no human works can result in salvation. There's nothing that can save us because we are sinners. There's no good that will really measure up to the standard that God is requiring. And thirdly, uh, we rely totally on Christ alone, by faith alone for our salvation. It's nothing else that we can do. Plain and simple. Charles Spurgeon said this, it is not great faith but true faith that saves. It's not great faith, but it's true faith, sincere faith, faith that comes from the heart and not just from the mouth because everyone else is doing it. No, this is a personal thing that takes place between you and God. And that is when salvation kicks in. So there's more to salvation than just saying, oh, I believe in Jesus Christ and I give my life uh, to him. And then you walk around and you do exactly what you've been doing all your life. There has to come a change. So we see that in Jacob's life here. He comes back to Bethel and he recommits his life, understanding that God had made him a promise and his faith and trust has always been in God. And we come to verse two as he purifies his house. Look at verse two. And Jacob said to his household, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Now you remember Rachel hid that God from, his, from her father as, they, as Laban came to uh, find out where his God went. So obviously there were gods in the camp there were probably some of the servants who had their little gods too. And Jacob just said, that's it. That's it. We're cleaning house. We want all those guys out of here. And Jacob said, let us arise, go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way in which I have gone. So Jacob realized that God had always kept his side of the bargain, that he has only been blessed because of God. So let us cleanse ourselves let us go up to Bethel let's make an altar there and let's worship the Lord God and so Jacob gave all or they gave all their their idols to Jacob their gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears and Jacob hid them under a terebinth tree which is by Shechem interesting he takes all their jewelry takes all their items that they were worshiping and then he goes and he buries them by a terebinth tree. And we know that gold was used for idolatry. It was Aram who created that calf there below the mountain of Sinai. Um, Gideon had uh, a gold shah of some sort uh, made also. Uh, we know that uh, these items were offered up as sacrifices to these gods. When the, when the Egyptians along with the Jews left Egypt, they donated all their jewelry and stuff for this calf that they made out of gold. Jacob takes all this and he buries it under this terebinth tree, which is a towering tree. It's a pretty interesting tree. I, I have a message uh, where I talked about the tree and they came with a, a basket of wine and bread and they sat under the tree. And, and I, uh, in that message, I talk about how we come to the cross the cross of the tree, you know, representing the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's where we have communion, a picnic with the Lord, where we encounter God and it changes our lives. And that's what the terebinth tree here represents, the cross. It's a picture, uh, really, of Calvary. And I think that's what Jacob is doing. He's taking the idols and he's putting them at the feet of the cross and burying them there, never to resurrect them at all again in their life. 
And verse 5 says, They journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Because of Jacob's heart to cleanse his house, to bury this at the cross, the other nations began to fear them. God put a hedge around them and protected them. And so he builds this altar. Verse 6, Jacob came to Uz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he had fled from the face of his brother. El Bethel, basically in the Hebrew, is God of Bethel. Now, while this is happening, you remember Jacob has left Esau. They met, they embraced, they hugged, they said, we love each other. We're now acquaintances, we're relatives, but we're going to kind of keep, keep our distance from each other. Uh, this little story is kind of in the middle of all this where, where Jacob's uh, probably nurse, uh, when he was younger, uh, happens to pass away. She probably encountered Jacob uh, during this whole encounter with Esau. <clears throat> probably maybe even taking care of some of Jacob's uh, children, but she happens to pass away. So the Bible gives uh, so a memorial, I guess, in a sense, to her. It says in verse 8, Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried uh, below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alon Bekhath. So interesting that the Bible does that sometimes. It just throws in a little quick story there, right? Um, what it may mean, I don't know. Spend some time on there, and I'm sure there's, there's a good spiritual lesson there for us. Now we come to verse 9 through 15. God blesses Jacob as he is there in Bethel now. Then, the God, then God appeared to Jacob again when he had come to Padamaram, and he, he blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And this is where we get the name change. And Israel has stuck with them to this day. We have Israel today, the land of Israel, the Israelites who are there. And that is an amazing story. You, you don't hear of parasites. You don't hear of, hear of Amorites. You don't hear of any of those ites of the Old Testament. The only ones you hear of is the Israelites who are still alive and doing very well. The only nation that had resurrected and become a nation again. Not only have they resurrected as a nation, they actually resurrected the Hebrew language and over there you can go and speak the Hebrew language it is amazing you see God's hand upon Israel so clearly and yet so many people hate Israel I remember growing up as a young man hearing a lot of my relatives talking about the Jews and how the Jews own everything and how the Jews are in everything and it's the Jews that are controlling this whole nation and they're just such a hatred for Israel I didn't understand it at the time but when I became a Christian and I read the Bible, now it makes total sense. These are God's chosen people, Israel. And so no longer Jacob, but Israel, ruled by God. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. So he gives them a command there. I want you to be fruitful and multiply. God says the same thing to us. We should be fruitful and we should multiply. It is a priority in our life to do so. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you, Jacob, and to your descendants after you. And God went up from him to the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in that place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil upon it. A drink offering was actually uh, the pouring of oil upon the rock, which was a symbol of consecration. Here I have met God, and it's here that I make my consecration to God. Later on in the Levitical offering, the drink offering will become one of the offerings that the priests will offer during the sacrifices. We'll also see a wine, uh, wine being used as a drink offering, which speaks of the cross, the blood is the wine of Jesus Christ that we poured out upon the rock for us. The oil speaks of the work of the Holy Spirit, and these are offerings of consecration. And Jacob called the name of the place. God spoke with him, Bethel. So God with us. So, of course, my next point is consecration. 
Have you heard of the word consecration? You might have heard the word sanctification. I've mentioned that word several times. It's a little bit different than sanctification. <clears throat> but this is consecration. It's where we consecrate. The birth of a child is an exciting and happy event. I mean, we just celebrated Christmas. Yes, definitely the birth of our Savior. An exciting event. We all recognize birth as the beginning of new life. It's a new life that we're bringing into this world. It's a boy, it's a girl. And we're so excited to see this new life grow. But we never say it's an end or the conclusion of the fetushood, right? We never say that. We never think about the baby being in the womb. We just say, oh, a new life. And we don't even think about the old life that that baby had at all. It's true of believers. <clears throat> we, be, we get saved and we're born again and the Spirit of God moves in us truly a wondrous way and it doesn't end there. It is the beginning of a new life. And we don't think about the old life. We don't talk about the old life. Sometimes we do. Oh, that's back in those days, B.C., before Christ and so forth. But we're to look to the new life and not the old life. The old life is gone. It's past. We don't return to it. We go forward. <clears throat> it's our regeneration. It's the beginning of a spiritual journey from this day forward and we should always be facing forward and journeying forward in our spiritual journey not looking backwards we shouldn't be looking backwards and just as babies need to grow and develop we christians need to move forward step by step as we walk with the lord after we're regenerated the next step in our spiritual life is a long journey to the present to or to give ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is to consecrate ourselves to him. It is something that we do. It's an action that we take, an act of consecrating, dedicating to the service and worship of God, where we make a choice to say, Lord, I want to be consecrated to you. Ask me to do something for you and I will act upon it. It's different than sanctification because that's a work of the Holy Spirit in your life. But here, the Holy Spirit now is moving you to say, let me do something. Give you an example. When I got saved, <clears throat> never been to a Christian church in my life, went to the church and loved the church, heard the word of God being preached from the pulpit, and I just thought, this is where I want to be. And so, Lord, I didn't even understand what consecration meant, but I remember uh, them saying, we need somebody to, to help set up in the morning. I'll do it. <laughs> Lord, you, you asked, and I'm going to do it. I mean, I, just, I consecrated myself immediately. Not only did I consecrate myself, but I also consecrated my four boys, so you're going with me. <laughs> they had no choice in that. And they went with us. They went with me, and we cleaned toilets. We cleaned around the rings, and we, we shined those toilets so they were the shiniest toilets that, that anyone would see. And we did it all unto the glory of God. That's what consecration means. In the Bible, the word consecration means to separate of oneself from things that are unclean, especially anything that would contaminate one's relationship with a perfect God. Consecration also carries the, the connotation of sanctification, holiness, and purity, as I said. But you are consecrating yourself from the world and saying, I want to be a part of God's kingdom. And as true believers in Christ, the act of consecration involves our lives being a living sacrifice to him. We are totally separated from a, defiled, a defilement of the world. Every day we are to live out our lives as a holy and royal priesthood, as Peter commanded us in 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 through 10, for the glory of God. You know who lived a consecrated life? It was John the Baptist. His life was consecrated from birth, set apart for God's glory. And when he was of age, he went out into the wilderness eating locusts and honey, preparing the way of the Lord. His whole life was set apart for God. And he fulfilled it until the day that they beheaded him. Now that's a glorious life. So what is consecration? Consecration is our giving ourselves to the Lord to become a living sacrifice. As Paul said in Romans 12.1. I exhort you therefore brethren 
through the compassions of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy while pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. Have you set up your pillar? Like Jacob poured oil of a consecrated life on it? I hope that you would consider getting involved in 2017. Saying, Lord, what is it that you want me to do in the church that you've called me to? Where do you want me to serve you, Lord? How can I consecrate myself for your glory, Lord? Now we come to the death of Rachel. Sadly, Jacob loved this gal. And this will devastate him, I'm sure. But there's still a work for him to do. And he will do it. Look at verse 16. <clears throat> then they journeyed from Bethel. And when there was a, but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had a hard labor. Now it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, or in other words, she was dying, that she called his name Ben-Onai. But his father called him Benjamin. Uh, I'm sure that Jacob, because of the situation, didn't want to be reminded of the child being ben Omain, which which signifies sorrow through the birth. He changed it to Benjamin uh, as more of a joyful type of thing taking place because of the loss of Rachel. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephraim, that is Bethlehem. Ephraim is another way of saying Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is uh, the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Um, and we do have it today. They actually have a little monument there on Rachel's uh, burial site. You can see it in, in Israel. And they go there and they do pray uh, to to uh, those that have passed. They They do protect their dead very, very well because they believe in the resurrection that is to come. But I'm sure that Jacob was devastated. But even though he was devastated, and just a quick point here, he knew that God had a plan. He believed in the resurrection. He believed that he would see Rachel again one day. And so he knew that he was just, he, he was just uh, or she was changing address, in a sense, moving out for a while, and that he would see her again. David made that very clear to us when he lost his first child. Very, very clear. He was mourning, he was praying, he was fasting, he was begging God, and then the child passed. And then he got up, he cleaned himself, and he went about his business. And, and the servants did not understood, understand this. So they were used to crying and crying, and then once the baby dies, they continue to cry and cry. There's no hope, I don't want to live, blah, blah, blah. You know, all of these things, they just they didn't understand why David didn't go through the same thing. It was foreign to them. You know, and they could complain, and they could say, oh, he just doesn't understand our pain and our suffering. No, he totally understood the promises of God that he would see that child again. And so he wasn't worried about it because that child just went to heaven in the presence of the Lord in glory, fulfilled, complete. God's purpose is, is done in that life. And he stood up and he just walked off. Okay, God, fulfill your plan in my life now while I'm here on this earth. I read a, a wonderful little story about about uh, moving addresses, and I don't, I'm not going to be able to quote it because I don't remember the whole thing, but the gist of it is, and I'll just summarize, is that <clears throat> we say goodbye, and it's not a goodbye forever. It, it's as though <coughs> we move to another state, and we don't see you for a while, but we'll see each other again. It's not going to be forever, and so it's only for a bit of time, and then we'll be reunited, and we'll be able to spend a lot of time together with one another, and that was the gist of the whole story, and that is so true, and instead of mourning and being bitter and being upset, we need to get busy about the Lord's business because there are a lot of other people that need the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. They need to hear the salvation message and the hope of the resurrection that there is a resurrected day and we'll see our loved ones again. Yes. So the sin of Reuben here in verse 21 through 22. Um, another thing that's just thrown in here, uh, a constant reminder, I think the writer is telling us as we are moving on, you know, uh, Isaac's gonna die 
And, and then eventually uh, Jacob will die, and then we have the 12 boys that will become 12 nations. But the writer's revealing to us that they too are, are sinners. And so in verse 21, then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the towers of Eber. Uh, Miguel Eber, uh, the meaning of the place is named the Tower of the Flocks. And it happened when Israel dwelt, and that's Jacob, remember, Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Baha'i, his father's concubine. And Israel heard about it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. Now it doesn't say that, is, that Israel did anything about it. He just heard about it, and he didn't do anything about it. And you would think as a good father, you would do something about it, but what could you do about it? You know, what you did was wrong. Well, it's already been done. And eventually, God will repay him because Reuben will lose uh, his birthright, being the firstborn of Israel now. But he'll lose his birthright. He'll go to someone else. And so God will judge them. But Jacob doesn't do anything. He just moves on. And now we have the 12 sons of Jacob. And Reuben is the eldest one. Look at verse 23 through 26. <clears throat> Moses lists the 12 sons here the sons of Leah were Reuben Jacob's firstborn and then Simon Levi Judah Issachar and Zebulun and then the sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin and then the sons of Baha'i were Rachel's maidservants were Dan and Naphtula and the sons of Zelpha Leah's maidservants were Gad and Asher and these were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padam Aram now what a dysfunctional family <laughs> <laughs> They all had different moms. Same father, but different moms. Has anything changed in our world today? <laughs> Not really. I mean, it is a sad commentary, and God has set up the proper order of marriage and how it should be. And God definitely does not approve of this, and I have to say that, right? Because he doesn't approve of it, though it happened. And he still uses you, <laughs> you know? God, you're amazing. You are amazing. And we see that, um, that Isaac, Jacob's father, passes, verse 27. And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Miriam, that Kirith Erba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. And now the days of Isaac were 180 years. Wow, good old age. So, <laughs> so Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So the death of Isaac brought Jacob and Esau back together again. And I'm sure that they spent time reminiscing and sharing and talking with each other. Now, you have to really understand that Jacob lived a blessed life. Okay, how? <laughs> you, like, how did he live a blessed life? Well, you know, we totally misunderstand what being blessed is, I really think we do. It's not what you think it is, but I think he lived a blessed life. First of all, God used him. Amen. He fulfilled his promise in his life. That is a deep blessing. See, we are blessed, but not in the way that we believe that we should be blessed. For a believer is the blessed life, which is synop synonymous with the successful life. It's not the same as the world views life. Is it the Christian version of the good life? Is that what we have of the world? So do we look at the world and say, oh, so, so the Christian life is just better than that. So it's more money, bigger houses, more cars. No, no, not at all. Not at all. A loving marriage obedient children, vibrant ministry, a healthy body, a successful career, uh, trusted friends, financial, financial abundance. Are these the characteristics of a blessed life? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> but maybe not. Maybe not. I mean, it's nice to have all those things, but is that all? No. If someone has had all these things, would he be extraordinarily blessed? I don't know. I think this is God's view of what a blessed life is. And I think that we as Christians, and I'm challenged too here, is that we need to change our perspective on what blessings are. And we have a clear example what it is to be blessed in the Beatitudes, don't we? 
clear example. When you look at the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, it says, seeing the multitude, he went up to the mountains, and he actually sat down with his disciples. So he's talking to his disciples, to believers, so he's talking to us as believers, and he's telling us what it is to be blessed. And so we have to take Jesus as his word. He opened his mouth and he taught him and he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's blessed. When you, rely, when you realize your depravity, that you have nothing without God. And then he says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wow. When you acknowledge your depravity and your poverty, spiritually speaking, and that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about wealth here. Then he says, you have the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. So you're telling me that when we're mourning, when we're suffering in that mourning, that it's a, it's a blessing? Yeah, that's what it says. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What a blessing to be comforted by God. How many times have you mourned and cried and asked God to help you, to comfort you, and all of a sudden he comes in and he just comforts you? What a blessing that is. Isn't it a blessing to, as a child, and you remember these times when you're hurting, you're in pain, and who comes in? Mom. And she just puts her arms around you, and you're like, oh, this is so good. This is so good. I always used to, I felt blessed to see my boys come to their mom, and I would see her just have her arms around and just hugging them loving them and comforting them through their through their hard times and i've seen her do that several times not me but her <laughs> but that's a blessing for them so it's a blessing that we're mourning and god comes and he comforts us that's a blessing blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth the bible says so, so being a meek person is a blessing that is power under control, being meek. <clears throat> I was reading an article, and it was, um, the topic of it was how to receive criticism. <clears throat> yeah, and it's one of my struggles, I guess. But in the article, it talks about being meek and that we should receive criticism, as, even as pastors, it was written to pastors, that we should actually invite people to criticize us. And it's challenging, because you don't want to be criticized. It's, it's nice when someone says, good message. But, okay, so where can I improve, though? How can I improve? Because I want to be better. So, being meek, I have the authority as a pastor not to ask for any criticism, <laughs> you know, but... To be meek to say, hey, I'd like to hear some criticism. That would be a challenge and say, I want to get better and your criticism may help me do that. doesn't mean that you have to agree with them or even accept it, but to be able to hear it and say, okay, you might have a valid point there and I need to pray about it. That's meekness, where you're able to humble yourself. And it says, you'll inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled that's another blessing. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So if you are merciful, you're a blessed person. You're a blessed person. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now what a blessing that is, that you will literally see God. If you're pure in heart, something to strive for. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteous sake. Now there's a blessing. There's a blessing in persecution. If you're being persecuted, then you're blessed. It's a sign and evidence of your blessedness. It's not prosperity like the world. It's not what the world views as being blessed, but it's what Christians view as being blessed. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And notice he puts falsely in there, right? It, it should be falsely. If they're telling the truth, then maybe you need to, again, look at it and, and change. <clears throat> but again, these are the things that the Bible says are blessings 
for believers. He ends with rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's a blessing. That's being a blessing. You look at the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and you see all the martyrs for Christ. Their names are in the hall of faith. They will be there for eternity. That's a blessing. Oh, you can't stand before the gates of heaven and say, hey, I was prosperous in the world, Lord. I had the biggest corporation. I helped a lot of people. That's a blessing. I got a lot of tax write-offs, paid little taxes. That's a blessing. It's not what the Bible says. I got several houses. I've got a house in Palm Springs, and I have a house in Malibu. That's a blessing. It's not what the Bible says. Those are blessings on the earth, and they're temporal. These are eternal blessings. Jacob had eternal blessings from the Lord, not temporal blessings. Are you blessed? You are all blessed. You just don't realize it yet. You don't realize it yet. You're blessed. Are you being persecuted at one point or another? You're blessed. You're blessed. Are you attempting to be pure and walk a good life? Then you're blessed because God's going to reveal himself to you. See, we need to change our perspective of what blessings are. We might not have everything in the world. And I know a lot of us don't have. We're barely even making it. But that's not what blessings is. It's being used of the Lord. We're consecrated to God and we're serving him. So we're blessed to be able to pour into one another, to be able to serve one another. Those are the blessings of the Lord. True blessedness. Are you blessed? Yes, we're blessed.